thank you very much. I, I really uh, am grateful for the opportunity to talk here. And I was reminded that uh, four years ago at this time, I was just about to head off to an abortive. I, I actually did go to Denver for the March meeting and was there when it got canceled. And uh, I guess it, we can say that this is one of the uh, few good things to come out of COVID. So um, yeah, it's, it's great to be able to give a talk. So what I wanted to do, uh, um, uh, is to uh, uh, give in this first half hour kind of um, maybe like a, a survey of things that I found uh, interesting in terms of applications to control theory. And it's going to focus on um, control theory as it's enabled experiments. Um, the research talk will, will maybe touch on more theoretical things, but um, control has had a, a, a really important role in some seminal experiments and some of my favorite experiments in uh, uh, biophysics. And I thought I would take you through a few of them um, with kind of the goal of uh, maybe expanding uh, the view of what control is possible and what it can mean. So I'll, I'll start um, uh, at, at, say, at the beginning with maybe one of the most basic uh, parts of control, which is regulation. And so you have some some signal temperature, pressure, flow, pH, uh, position, and you would like it to be constant in the face of fluctuations. Um, you can you can buy devices for this called controllers. Um, they were the, the 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 first notions go back at least to the 1880s. Uh, Otto Lehmann uh, developed a microscope that had what we would now call a hot stage, and he. Um, was able to do microscopy at a range of different temperatures and among other things discovered liquid crystals and I, you can see Robin in the uh, uh, audience so um, right away there was a, a, a really significant uh, 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 benefit from using control so the the the, the basic kind of situation in, in a setting like this uh, this is this is sort of the kind of diagram that if you open a book on control theory you'll see uh, you have a uh, some kind of reference signal, um, which you would like to to which could be constant and you would like to track. Um, this is the physical system that you want to control and you measure some output and you feed that output back, often subtracting it from the reference to form an error. and then you apply some kind of algorithm, which is also known as a controller to in this case keep the signal constant. So if you do that, this controller uh, often has a form where it's just a, a constant. so this 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 is all done in, frequency space or Laplace transform variable. Um, this E the error is defined as the difference between the reference and the observation. So it's a negative feedback and negative feedback is, is kind of built in. in. In the time domain, it might be a little easier to understand that the, 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 the sig, which, which you want to apply to the um, system is something that would be proportional to the error or negative with the negative sign. Um, and also to the integral and derivative. And this sort of PID, proportional integral derivative control, is sort of what a lot of people think about when they talk about feedback. Um, this can work very well for a simple system. If you, if you look at it a little more deeply, it turns out that there is an implicit assumption when you write down an algorithm like this, that the system that you're trying to control is a second order system. So it could be like a harmonic oscillator, it could be first order system too, of course. So it could be just something relaxing. So if it's got one or two modes and if it's oscillating, then this is a great algorithm. And you have a lot of freedom with three parameters to tune. And since many dynamical systems have a dominant relaxation or a dominant oscillation mode, this often works pretty well. And as I said, it's so widespread that people have a tendency to think that, well, this is all that I need to know about uh, uh, feedback and control theory. And so what I wanted to do is sort of uh, give you a little bit of a survey of, of other applications that, that have gone beyond this. Okay, so I'll start with a famous uh, development by Howard Berg in the early 1970s, who built a microscope that could track bacteria in swimming around in the motion. Um, so here's the, 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 the technical diagram. You have a, you have a microscope here. Uh, the objective, this is the sample, the bo box with bacteria, as he put it, uh, and the condenser. And there's a there's a kind of an electromechanical 
feedback loop that's implemented where you have uh, you 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 have something that can measure the particular the position of the bacterium using photomultipliers and 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 analog electronics, and then feed this back onto voice coils that could move the stage. And so uh, the the rough idea is that when the bacteria moves, the stage moves to keep it in the field of view. And in the paper, we come across this statement: the scene through the binocular is extraordinary. The bacterium being tracked seems to be stuck in the center of the field, turning this way and that trying to free itself, while the other bacteria drift in and out of focus, then to and fro in apparent synchrony. Now, one of the things, which, I mean, I, I just as, a, as a, it's a very nice uh, paragraph, but also that's it. There's there's no photo, there's no movie, there's no SI, that's, that's all you get. Um, it was a simpler time, I guess. Um, and anyway, this, so, so then Berg went on though, to use this to make a, 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 an important discovery, which is the famous run-twiddle motion of E. coli. Um, you can look it up. <laughs> and uh, uh, so this, this, this had a huge impact in, in uh, sort of the developing field of biophysics, one could say. Now, we can forward 40 years later and ask, well, what, what, what's possible with 40 years of advances in, in technology? And um, this led to actually being able to do the same kind of thing, but to a single dye molecule diffusing in water, which is really, it's really a remarkable experiment done by Alex Fields and Adam Cohen uh, uh, at Harvard. Um, I, was, I was lucky enough to be on sabbatical there while this was, was going on. Um, and so here you can see this is, this is a, uh, 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 photodiode measuring the intensity of uh, a signal coming from, from a, a field of view. And when there's no feedback, it's very low. There's occasional flashes as maybe something swims through, fluorescent molecule swims through and diffuses out. Um, and when you have the feedback, this is, this is for several seconds, you get a signal and then you might lose it for a moment and, 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 it, and then goes away. Um, you can make constructs. This, this is with a dye molecule called Alexa 647. And you can also make a construct where you have two dye molecules and a bit of double-stranded DNA. And now you can see there's like level two of intensity, then, then one of the fluorophores bleaches, you have level one, and then, and then it, every, all, everything bleaches and it goes away. And you can measure while this is happening, the diffusion constant, um, essentially just by reconstructing the motions that you have to do to keep it centered. Um, and this is 300 microns squared per second. And if there are experimentalists among you, that's that's very, very fast. Um, in fact, it's so fast that one might want to do a reality check to see if this is even possible. And so if you just think about diffusion, how far you diffuse in a certain time, you can actually see. So what this, what this is, is doing is actually responding to every single photon that is detected. So normally when you have do microscopy, we're integrating photons to build up a signal. But here, you're, you're monitoring every single photon count and then applying a force to, to, to recenter the molecule. It's not moving the stage, it's too, too fast to do that, but it's, it's, it's applying an electrical force to, to center the molecule, acting every, every time that the uh, uh, a photon is detecting. And so if you ask how long is it between photons and how far does it get, how far can it diffuse, you find it's 0.1 micron. So it's just inside the field of view of a, of a microscope. So it's kind of at the limit of what's possible, but it, it, it actually works. Um, and yeah, I think it's an amazing experiment. So just to give you a flavor for how something like this works, kind of in the abstract, what it's based on is um, trying to update an estimate of where the molecule is. Of course, optical resolution is, is you know, to, uh, uh, couple hundred nanometers and we're trying to figure out where a molecule is uh, uh, that's, that's far smaller. Um, so, so we have to distinguish between the true state, this is where the fluorescent dye molecule is, from the observation, which is where uh, the photons detected, or where you would think it is based on the photon detection. And there's an organized way of doing this that are called Bayesian filtering equations that were developed in the early 1960s. And the rough idea which is very simple is the following. You, you, you assume that you already have an estimate. So this is at time step K, 
the let's say the position it's the state of the system but the, in this case the position of the molecule given a set when i have a superscript here I'll, I'll i'll think of the history so this is all the observations up until the present and so if you knew this then you could predict where it will be at time step k plus one just using the dynamics so this is the um knowing where the particle is now, where is it going to be in the future? So this, this could be encoded in a deterministic equation of motion. It could have uh, uh, probabilistic, there could be noise in there that, that makes the answer probabilistic, there usually is. Um, but however, you know, as long as you, as you can write down this kind of propagator, then you can predict where it is. And then once you, into, then once you get the new count, or the, sorry, the new observation at time k plus one, then you just use Bayes' rule to update uh, from 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 here to here. So this is just a straight application of of Bayes' rule, and uh, so it's it's really uh, 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 a deceptively simple set of equations. Now the catch is that if you were to write this out in almost any uh, 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 with almost any set of dynamics and 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 measurement noise, uh, it would be very difficult to solve, and you could only do approximations. But there are two important cases where you can actually solve things. Uh, uh, rigorously and 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 basically analytically, one is known as a hidden Markov model, and that's for another day. And the other is uh, uh, that that's for discrete states when the states are continuous, when when the position can be a continuous variable, and you, uh, the motion is linear, the noise is Gaussian, and so on. You have something called a Kalman filter. Um, if time were continuous, you would have a, a Fokker-Planck equation for the prediction. Um, and so, at least. There are some some cases where you can pull this off, and then there are other cases where it's not a Kalman filter, for example, but it's close to a Kalman filter, and 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 you can start from there. Um, and uh, as an example of what this would give, let's say that our potential is is uh, a double whale. So now it's now now we're outside of what a Kalman filter could describe, because a Kalman filter would need linear dynamics or harmonic potential. But you have a double whale potential, and it can hop back and forth. So up here. Um, this in in black is the true state of the system. So it's hopping. It's in the in in one well, and then it's hopping to the other well, and it's hopping this well. But in in gray, I hope you can see in the background. These are the observations that you would be measuring, and in the observations, it's much less clear. There's 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 the the the, the spread of the noise is almost as much as the uh, uh, jump. Nonetheless, if you take those equations that I just showed you and solve them, uh, the the what comes out of it looks looks pretty good. Um, I, I should emphasize that this is not a set of positions. This is a set of probability density functions. And so what happens is that uh, you 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 start with um, what you what, what's called the prior, what you what you think where you think the particle is, which would be some distribution. And now you're getting these 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 dark grays are the represent the photon counts, which the individual uh, measurements with their uncertainties. And so now you, you start out saying, okay, I'm in the, the left well, but now you start to see you know, a, a count somewhere over here, a position measurement over here, a position measurement over here. And so your opinion starts to, to flip. Here you're about 50-50, you don't know where it is. And after three observations, you decide, okay, there's really been a hop. And so now you think that it's likely in the uh, second half. But these are probably density functions. There's always a bit of probability, you know, chance that you might be wrong. And it's only here that you really kind of settle into. I'm, I'm sure it's in the, the other well. Um, anyway, so this is a, an example of how this kind of uh, tracking would work. And this is what was implemented in the uh, uh, single molecule diffusing case. Um, so there are other kinds of tracking that one can do. Uh, another example that's actually in some ways very similar is an atomic force microscope where you have a, a, a cantilever and you're following a sample surface. And um, feedback plays an important role in being able to track this surface. And it's really the same problem as the microscope that this uh, um, a cantilever has a very narrow range of motion over which it's sensitive. Either you're, you're lightly touching the surface um, or you're jammed in, which is bad, or you're off, which is bad. So you have to be sort of touching it with just the right amount of force or, or close to touching it. And so you have to sort of track the surface. And uh, uh, you can do this with a piezoelectric scanner that has a micron scale range, so much, much longer. This is like having the voice coil and you know, limiting field of view in the microscope and a voice coil that can move the stage a much bigger distance. And so you're turning a short range sensor kind of over to a long range actuator that can keep it in the, in the range of the sensor. 
Um, so you, you're, you're trading off one kind of limitation given that you have uh, uh, something that can move or, or, or uh, uh, put a force on, on the system to keep it in one place. Um, so this is just kind of a, very similar to what uh, uh, Howard Berg did, but on a, on a different scale. Um, actually, feedback plays and control plays another role in the lateral scanning of an AFM, which is something I was involved in a long time ago, where you you um, uh, you use the sort of the, the in the earliest versions it was like a tube scanner that would bend. Now it's something a little more organized, but they um, all depend on these piezoelectric materials, which are nonlinear. They have hysteresis and creep. They're kind of nasty. And so if you just op did open loop, sort of didn't have any kind of control, if you were to sort of make displacements, the what you would get out of it is kind of all over the place. Like it, it, it comes back with hysteresis. If you wait, it kind of drifts around. And it's a common thing to put, uh, uh, actually a combination of feed forward and feedback to, to, to linearize this. The, the feed forward part is basically just applying a pre-correction that tries as close as it can to invert the dynamic. So if, you, if this were your system and you could apply something beforehand that would be its inverse, then uh, uh, then that would give you something that you wouldn't need control in principle. Um, the problem is, of course, in a causal system, if you were to invert it, it would be anti-causal. So that's that's not quite possible, and, but you can try to approximate it to some extent. Anyway, so the 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 the, the main message is just that that um, control actually plays a, a, a big role in something like an AFM, not only in, in its ability to scan, uh, track, but also in its ability to, to scan. Um, so, um, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of, uh, inversion that I was talking about is, is, is static, but you can also do a dynamic inversion And this, this I'll just point out as a possibility that's kind of fun. So if you had a system that had nonlinear dynamics and then your control were somehow just added, then, you know, kind of an obvious idea is just make your control the negative of the nonlinear part and then add a linear uh, uh, extra part, and now you've got linearized dynamics. So there are cases where you can basically make a nonlinear nonlinearity go away and turn something that would have complex, chaotic, whatever kind of dynamics, and uh, uh, just just kind of um, replace it by a linear system. So this feedback linearization um, is is a really nice technique. In general, you know things do not separate quite so nicely. And so it can be much more complicated. And there's a whole story of differential geometry and so forth that that says when you can do this and how. Um, but the, the 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 basic part of the idea is, is is to try to do something as close to this as as you can. Um, and so this is a way to kind of tame complicated dynamics. Um, so something that I've been personally involved with and uh, uh, that was a lot of fun is is um, kind of creating new dynamics. So I mentioned this this double well potential. So if you had a double well potential, you could do the kind of things we were talking about of tracking and so forth. But what if you don't have a double well potential like that? You can actually create one using feedback. So the idea is you you make an image or measure the position of your particle uh, uh, and then estimate its position. And then you say, well, if we had this potential of that, this is all in one dimension here. If we had this potential, and we measured it here, then it should feel a certain force in this direction. And then maybe we have a way of applying force, perhaps as a charged particle and we, we apply an electric field or something like that. And if you do this fast enough, then you can create a kind of virtual potential that uh, uh, um, will mimic the dynamics. And as far as the particle is concerned, it really is moving in this kind of uh, system. And so uh, uh, this is an idea that again, traces back to Adam Cohen when he was a grad student with W.E. Murner. Um, but we tried to ex extend it to do uh, kind of more quantitative work in, in statistical physics. So you can you can make a histogram of position counts. This is for harmonic potential, and then use Boltzmann to uh, 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 figure out where it is. Um, you have to do this, as I said, with a short time step. Otherwise, it can actually go unstable. But that can be interesting too, because if you look at the power spectrum um, with short time steps, you get something that's just like your overdamped dynamics and harmonic oscillator, with long time steps, it actually looks like it's underdamped. Even though this is a, this is a particle moving in low Reynolds number, the fact that the feedback loop has these long time correlations can make it look qualitatively and actually in this case even quantitatively like an underdamped particle. So the 
the dynamics of a, of the sampled system when you're just making observations at sampling in time is indistinguishable from an underdamped particle. Um, so what can you do with this? Well, you can make this double well potential and see it hop back and forth and look at escape times and so forth. What we did was we made a big well. So it was a, a deeper well. So it actually acted kind of like a one bit memory. So it would only, once it was trapped in one well, it wouldn't spontaneously hop on any time scale. And we looked at it to measure using tech tools of stochastic thermodynamics, the amount of work it would take to quote unquote, erase or reset a memory like that. So you've done an observation, it's a two state system and this position records uh, zero or one, whether it's, whether uh, uh, say a Zillard box or something like that, a, a particle is the left or the right side of the barrier. And the prediction is that if you have a one bit memory, this, this is called Landauer limit, that there's a minimum cost to erase this at a temperature T, which is KB T log two. And so we can measure, um, we can make our potential, since it was virtual, we could make it do anything we want. So we could create this protocol that, that I'm sketching here. And you start with something that can be in two states. And at the end of the erasure, it's, it's reset to a standard reference state. And so that costs you at least KT log two. And so you can measure the work for different cycle times when it's uh, very fast. There's a lot of spread in the cycle times that you measure. Um, this is the Landauer limit in gray. And as you get closer and closer, you can see the mean is, is approaching this, this Landauer limit. Of course, you can even see a few uh, uh, scattered runs that, that go below the limit, but the, the, the thermodynamic limit for small systems is really an ensemble limit where you imagine you have an, uh, an infinite ensemble. So we're talking that that refers to the mean and not to individual realizations. Um, another, just to change uh, 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 direction a little bit. Another another thing that you can do with control is basically to construct collective effects. So um, here, this is this is a really beautiful experiment by Pascal Martin on on the sensory hair cell bundle. And the issue there was that they wanted to the, the, these are um, uh, transducers of acoustic waves, acoustic generated motion to ion channels. So when uh, uh, there's there's a mechanical motion. It, it, it moves these little um, hair cells in a direction and changes the ion flow into the in, in, into the cell, and that's part of the, the 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 hearing process or sensing process. And so these are these are actually coupled together in the inner ear. And so they they wanted to understand what the effects of this coupling are, but they only had one hair bundle, and they wanted to figure out what, what are the effects of being coupled to an array of these. But what they could do is set up a feedback experiment where they would use feedback to apply the forces from this array. And so they could kind of construct self-consistently a sort of virtual array of this. And, and what they found is that, that they could get synchronization, which is believed to enhance the sensitivity. So it's, it's a biologically important process. But this idea that you can sort of, I have one element and I want to make any N of them and I can use feedback to sort of couple them, I thought is a very pretty one. Um, a kind of related idea, which also relates to the virtual potentials, is that instead of having a virtual potential, you can have a virtual interaction among particles. So these are two-body interactions that are that are uh, created among uh, um, colloidal particles. And just adding in the two-body interactions is enough to sort of create these new uh, collective states. So again, these these are interactions that are mediated by feedback. So otherwise, these are just particles independently diffusing and occasionally bumping into each other. And, and the interactions they add are just, just between pairs, but that's enough to get this kind of self-organization. Um, and so I have one last non-biophysics example, but I, I thought just since we were talking about tracking, um, you know, I, I, I started, we started with uh, Howard Berg in, in the early seventies, and then I showed you this for, for a single bacterium. And then in 2000, 11, there was Alex Fields and, and, and Adam Cohen's experiment on, on a single dye molecule diffusing around in water. Uh, this, is, this is from a few months ago. So it turns out uh, uh, there are drones and people actually like to race drones. And I, I had no idea, but, um, but, the, but they do. And so you can try to, um, so it's actually a sport where people go and they'll set up little gates and they'll have drones and they'll control them and they'll try to make them go through some course as fast as possible. So naturally, this is something that 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 attracts people interested in control and, and in machine learning. And so there was a kind of a, a face-off between um, 
I would say, a sort of more traditional optimal control approach, which is a part of control I haven't mentioned yet, where the idea is that, you know, how do you design a controller? Well, one strategy is to come up with some kind of cost function that measures sort of uh, how bad, you know, the, the deviations from what you would want it to be, and then try to find the control that minimizes the cost. Um, and so that's a general approach. It's called optimal control. And, and the first thing I always tell people is, you know, do not confuse optimal with good because it depends entirely on being able to specify what you want. And that turns out to often be a tricky thing. Reinforcement learning is a machine learning technique which can be used for, which has been used for control. And uh, it, it, it doesn't need an explicit model of the system dynamics, which optimal control depends on. So optimal control, you put in quote, the quote unquote known dynamics of the system and constraints. Um, reinforcement learning kind of just plays around and tries to reconstruct that. Um, and so this was a nominally a face-off between optimal control and reinforcement learning, and, and these were from machine learning, so they they were uh, uh, making a big deal that uh, reinforcement learning was was doing better than optimal control. Essentially, of course, how can you be better than optimal? Well, you can have a better cost function, and so that was what they were claiming. But 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 equally significantly, um, they compared this to the human champions, and the 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 the, the impressive or scary part was that. The claim is that on on a basically on a on a laptop machine or a standard uh, single computer trained for about half an hour can beat the world champion. So that 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 that's pretty amazing. And since the theme of this is sort of kind of wonder, I thought I would just show you what this looks like. John, just just to let you know, we're almost at the bottom of the hour. Just to to make sure, if you want to yep. stay on track time wise for the okay. research, talk to you. Um, Thanks. Yeah. So let me let me just summarize here. Um, these are real. This has been a kind of a little bit of a random walk. I'm not sure it's a tutorial, but it's a, a bit of a random walk through control. And and so these are just a few of my favorite things. So we've looked at regulation, tracking, linearization, uh, the creation of virtual potentials, new dynamics, new collective motions. These are called state-to-state -state transitions. And I've tried to slant this towards biophysics, but you could really do this to almost any subfield of physics, just, just making slightly different choices. And you know, as I said, what we know about the world is often through a clever use of control. And But what I was trying to get across also is just this kind of, when, when you first are doing this, there's a real sense of amazement. And this was captured by Arthur C. Clarke a number of years ago in this, this famous statement about any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And, um, but there's a correlate to that too, which is that uh, wonder and magic kind of fade. And so uh, the engineers sometimes call control technology, control the hidden technology, because once it's integrated, we're kind of unaware of it. So we're unaware of all the control systems in our body. And, uh, um, and, 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 and when we get on a plane, we're unaware of all of its controls or in a car until something goes badly wrong. Um, what I haven't had a time to talk about is sort of, you know, not so much about control in biology that, that you know, w in biological systems, control is an important concept. There's homeostasis, gene regulation. I'm going to talk about molecular motors in a second a little bit. And also in theoretical physics, there's lots of, of deep questions you can ask about limits to control from information theory, thermodynamics, causality, and so forth. Um, there's lots of cool tools, path integrals, large deviations, differential geometry, and so forth. Um, but these are all for another time.